So we're in from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 78, Text Number 17. This uh, chapter is entitled The Killing of Danta Vakra and Roma Harshana. <coughs> Shrutva yudo yamam ramaha Shrutva yudo yamam rama Kurunam saha pandavahi Kurunam saha pandavahai Tirtha bhikshaka vyajena Tirtha bhikshena vyajena Madhyastak prayayokila Madhya stak prayayokila Shrutva yudya doyamam rama Shrutva yudoyamam rama Kurunam saha pandavahai Tirtha bhikshaka vyajena Madhya stak parayayokila Shrutva yuddo yamam ramaha Kurunam saha pandavahai Majastak praya yokila. Sorry, Tirtha big shake of Yajena. Majastak praya yokila. Shrut vayudo yamam rama. Purunam saha pandavahai. Tirtha bhikshaka vyajena Madhya stak prayayokila Matajis. Shrut 
Shrutva hearing Yudha for the battle Udyamam the preparations Ramaha Lord Balaram Kurunam of the Kurus Saha with Pandavahai the Pandavas Tirtha in holy places Abhisheka of bathing Yajena on the pretext Majestat neutral Prayayo he departed Kila indeed translation Lord Balaram then heard that the Kurus were preparing for war with the Pandavas being neutral he departed on the pretext of going to bathe in holy places in response please Lord Balaram then heard that the Kurus were preparing for war with the Pandavas being neutral he departed on the pretext of going to bathe in a holy place or going to bathe in holy places okay so um, <clears throat> purport by his divine race Oh, purport by the servants of his divine race, S. E. Bhakti Vedanta Swami. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Both Duryodhana and Yudhisthira were dear to Lord Balaram. And so, to avoid and away an awkward situation, he departed. Furthermore, all killing, sorry, furthermore, after killing the demon Vidarata, Lord Krishna put aside his weapons, but Lord Balaram still had to kill Ramaharshana and Balvala to finish relieving the earth of her burden of demons. Om Gyanti Mirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Ve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Vayam rupa kadamayam dadati svabhadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Yuta Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Shcha Sri Rupam Sarvijatam Sahagana Raghunatham Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vanishvari Rishavanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Panchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayeva Cha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Karadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So Lord Krishna is going to uh, give up fighting. Um, but it's strange because he's going to the battle of Kurukshetra and he's going to give up fighting and Balaram it says one important word here he mentions the word um, pretext 
Vyajena. So pretext means that it seems apparently he's going to on pilgrimage, but he's going for another reason. And so there's two dichotomies here. Lord Krishna's giving up fighting and he's gone onto a battlefield <laughs> to be peaceful. <laughs> Anyway, charity can't be peaceful, but relatively speaking, he's not taking part in the fight. He's already said that. And on the other hand, Balaram, he doesn't want to fight. I'm not going to take part in this war. I'll just go on pilgrimage, and he's going to kill. <laughs> so it's pretty. So this. So it's very difficult to understand Krishna's pastimes. You know, in the material world, uh, in the spiritual context um, when pe materialistic people read these literatures by the charyas uh, they become confused and even maybe blasphemous sometimes because they don't understand they're not devotees in this uh, in the Bhagavad Gita explains that uh, Krishna can understand uh, Arjuna can understand because he's a devotee uh, so it's not ordinary knowledge. It's not that we can become a bookworm and understand these scriptures. There are many people in this world who are expert at uh, reading through the Shastras, memorizing them and then delivering them. But they have no realization because Krishna doesn't grant that benediction. So Bhagavad Gita tells us that Tesham Satata Yuktanam Bhajadam Priti Purvakam Dadadi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayantite that the real principle is, is not that we become learned, but we have the devotional attitude, pretty poor of a come. And Krishna says, even if we are not qualified to understand the process by virtue of hearing from the spiritual master and the devotees, or from reading the Shastras, because the attitude is correct, then we'll get all we need. We see some simple devotees, they don't appear to be of any... Um, real standing in devotional service as far as uh, doing much service you know not it's not there's no such a thing as high and low class service you know service is service but you know we, we, we sometimes become bewildered somebody's doing so much preaching so much but what is a motive that's the real principle and um, Prabhupada once said time will tell who's a devotee and who's not a devotee because devotional service is not a practice. It's not, we're, we're not practicing, it's a real thing. And Krishna's allowing us to go deeper and deeper into the heart. And uh, so this is why we, we, a devotee can start to understand the Shastras because he's seen how Krishna is using situations so that the devotee can gradually become more realized. Even in the material world, the same principles there, is it? You know, there's Leela in this. Is there Leela in the material world? The Mumbai Leela, Delhi Leela, Leela. It's all Leela, actually. But it's a Leela of Dukkha, the Leela of suffering. <laughs> and the spiritual world is a Leela of Sukha, the Leela of happiness. Um, I can give some examples, actually. Um, I wrote one down here. Yeah, well, when I first took to devotional service, um, I re started reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. I was on my own. I didn't have any association. Uh, I was about, the nearest temple was Manchester, which was about 50, 50 to 60 miles away. I didn't even know there was a temple there. I just got a book on the street and I tried to read it. The book was about God. I thought, that's enough. <laughs> I thought, I've heard enough about God. You know, I went to a Christian chapel and I, w I was, we had an evangelical teacher at school. And, uh, but every time I asked a question, I never was satisfied by the answers. Um, I'll give you an example. There's in the Bible, there's one, set, there's one I, don't know what, I don't know what particular... Uh, book it's in but there's it's describing the different ages of great sages in the Bible and uh, one was called Methuselah has anybody heard of Methuselah in England and in the West they say he's as old as Methuselah 
That means somebody's very old. And so Methuselah, he lived for nearly 2,000 years. So this must have been, you know, in a previous age. And uh, I thought, how can somebody live for 2,000 years, you know? Either this is a fairy story, or there's some, you know, real reason behind it. So I asked the, uh, this new teacher who was coming, he was on, uh, what they call it, when they, when they first start teaching, they're on, they go to different schools, and he was at our school for a while. I said, how is it that somebody can live for 2,000 years? And he said, uh, their years were shorter than ours. <laughs> So they were a good bit shorter. That means they were like oh, probably 200 times shorter. Uh, so, you know, understanding these things, I, I just gave up all hope of trying to understand the Bible. I just thought it, it, it's, it's not actually, fa it's a myth, it's a fairy story. And I started to become an atheist. And I became, in, got in, at the back of my mind, I always realized that, you know, there's something there, but I don't know what it is. But, you know, I can't follow this. It's just too abstract. It's not giving any information. And so when people come to... So many people in the West, when they, they're very... What's the word? When they come to read Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, they're not so inclined because they haven't had a very good experience previously. <coughs> and so... Um, another example is that when I started to read the Srimad Bhagavatam, I came across uh, one section where Dhruva Maharaj, I think it was Dhruva Maharaj, he was going from, you know, he was going from one city to another or one particular situation to another. And um, at one point, he started describing his, the different uh, social systems he was witnessing. He said that there's cities and there's villages and there's this. And then he said there's uh, prostitutes. And uh, this, and this blow. I thought, what? <laughs> what am I reading here? You know, in society, society is trying to abolish prostitution. And here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's naturally talking about prostitution. So, I, you know, I, got to, I started writing. <laughs> I, had to read, I wrote to the BBT, what's going off? You know, prostitutes in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> I got a very stiff letter back. It was one Mataji who answered. He says, you can't, you know, judge, judge a, a book by its cover. Don't, don't label people because of their particular situation. She was pretty sharp. But then uh, one uh, Prabhu wrote back, that, anyway, Matajis and men are all, we're all Prabhus, but for the sake of describing, what the, the chief of the BBT in England wrote, and he uh, started to describe things in a little bit more detail. Then I could start to understand so, you know, when we come to hearing about Krishna's pastimes, we have to have a lot of patience. And we have to understand that there's a whole leela going off. And this is what throws most people, is that how can this sage, who's meeting Krishna, be an impersonalist? And how can this? But well, it doesn't work like that. Krishna's using different situations and different people in different contexts. We don't go on the extra... And this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing on the pretext, Balaram, he appears to be... <clears throat> going for a peaceful time but he's going for the exact opposite and what is that? that means that um, he's doing a service which is just as important as Krishna's Balaram te tends to take the back seat uh, but he's the supreme personality of God also but he's always showing us how to be a, a devotee of the supreme Lord even though he's qualified himself uh, he's always a servant of the Lord so in this situation, Krishna's taking the front position of speaking Bhagavad Gita on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Why? So that, you know, society can have proper guidance. So that, you know, the, the system of uh, training people in spiritual life can be done through saintly kings instead of impious kings. So everybody understands that point. What's that verse in the fourth chapter about the disciplic succession? Evam parampara praptam, imam raja seyobhru, sakalena mahata yoga nasta parantapa. And this knowledge is coming through vivasvan in the previous verse. So it's coming through the saintly kings. So this is nicely explained in Bhagavad Gita that this is Krishna's duty. The whole Mahabharata is set around this. They're all around kshatriyas. All around this. Why? Because, you know, people are interested in this 
uh, intrigue. Mahabharata is very popular because of the intrigue and stories. We can't wait for the next episode. You know, everybody's waiting. It's like left on a cliffhanger for the next episode. Anybody notice that when they've showed the Mahabharata? Da da da! Da da da! What will happen next week? <laughs> and everybody can you know, they're driving down the street, the bus driver, and it's time for the Mahabharata. <laughs> Into the nearest place to watch the television. Uh, so Krishna's priming like that. Uh, so he's using Mahabharat, he's using Bhagavad Gita. People are in, and, but more important, it talks about. So it talks about Balaram. Balaram is actually teaching us about the Brahman culture. That in charge of the sages at Naimisharanya is who is it? Oh, who's in charge of the sages at Naimisharanya? Roma Harshana Sutta and um, he comes from a Sutta, Sutta means uh, more or less Shudra they, I think it's that they carry the externally they carry the caste a little bit higher than a Shudra but it, by, they are actually classified as Shudras um, so because of Lord Balaram walked into the we were talking about what happens why Lord Balaram is going on this particular pilgrimage is that he goes east on the Sarasvati to the uh, Arabian, towards the Arabian Sea and then he turns right because the Sarasvati then winds the other way and he goes eastwards he goes past, he goes towards Mathura and then on to Naima Sharanya and there he sees the sages assembled ready to perform a thousand year sacrifice and there is Roma Harshana Sutta and of course, Roma Harshana Sutra is well versed in all the scriptures. He's the most learned scholar amongst all the particular sages there. Um, but Lord Balaram notices that um, he doesn't even stand up when the Supreme Personality of Godhead walks into the assembly. So he's thinking that what is the use of all this knowledge? He's not become gentle. He hasn't understood why he's using it. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of the class. We can understand things superficially. He doesn't even have the intelligence to understand what the Shastras are about. That it's to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And by his very activities, he's not even doing that. So why is he fit to sit, sit on the Vyasasan? And so therefore, he sees that uh, I have to teach a lesson to society. If, if the leader of this congregation of devotees or congregation of sages acts in such a way yad uh, yadya charity stress us then everybody will start to follow that example <clears throat> and so he remembered Roma Harshana Sutta's pre previous existence before he became learned and he still hadn't got rid of the Shudra quality what's the Shudra quality? one is to follow others to do what we're told but another one is, if we get any particular opulence, particularly with, you know, it's tendency for everybody, but it's particularly if we have a sudra tendency, is to become proud. And so this pride covers everything. It covered Roma Harshana Sutta's intelligence. And so Lord Balaram, he wanted to teach society that, you know, we can't, Brahmins and Vaishnavas have to act very nicely, according to Shastra. Otherwise, people follow in the footsteps. So he got a blade of kusha grass and he touched Roma Harshana Sutta. He immediately fell dead. Um, <clears throat> because, let's face it, the Shudra is higher than the Kshatriya. So, which is most important? Was it, which was the most important mission? Lord Krishna or Lord Balaram? I don't think anybody will answer that one. <laughs> but they were both the same. They were both as important. All members of the Varnashram are equally important. We can't have a Varnashram system without any one of them. But by, from, a, you know, from one point of view, we can see that, from a partial analysis, that you know, without the head, then nothing's going to work. We have Kshatriyas in place, but no head to actually guide them. So Balaram, in one sense, was doing more important work 
Of course, the sages, they then started to explain that this is not very, uh, not a very good activity to kill a Brahmin. And so, we see here some etiquette now. That Balaram immediately, although he's correct in what he did, he immediately listened to the sages. He was showing what Roma Harsh and Asuta didn't do. Although he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he still showed respect to, Roma, to the sages at Naimishranya. And they said, you have to amend what you've done. You have to reverse everything. And he said, please tell me what to do. He said, I'll, I'll reverse everything to the same situation as it was before. Nothing changed. He said, no, we, we, you won't need to do both. We want you to maintain what you've done. You've killed Roma Harsh and Asuta. But we also want the situation in such a way that uh, a Brahmin is not killed. And so the Supreme Personality of God then took the other role. This is the nature of an intelligent person. He knows how to act when uh, put under pressure, when he's questioned about his activities. And he knows how to act when he's responding to a question. And so he began to respond and took the authority for all. Previously was taking the uh, <coughs> the uh, humble role. And so in that particular situation he, st he started to explain that the son is as good as the father. So Sutta Goswami is the son of Roma Harshana Sutta. He carries on from, he's the living representative of the father. So he can speak Shrima, he can speak the um, Srimad Bhagavatam. And so in this way everything was amended. So this is an important point for devotees that uh, <coughs> knowing how to act in every situation the way Balaram did. And in the association of devotees, uh, are we all going to agree on certain things? Or is there going to be any disagreement? Sometimes very strong disagreement. So we have to have the intelligence to be able to what does intelligence mean, by the way? It's met this, I think there's two or three different descriptions of intelligence in the Bhagavad Gita. It means acquiring knowledge and being, not just acquiring knowledge, but being able to put it into practice. This is one form of intelligence. Another form of intelligence is being able to discriminate from matter and spirit. This is real knowledge. But there's another example of intelligence given also. And that is that <clears throat> there may be opposing opinions, but an intelligent person can see both opinions and not, and not be phased by them, not bewildered by two opinions, and is able to see both opinions and still act. An example of this is Ar Arjuna in the Battle of Kurukshetra. Arjuna, uh, after the battle, Ashvatthama, he went and killed the four sleeping sons of the Pandavas. He thought it was killing the Pandavas. But when he took the heads of the sons of the Pandavas to Duryodhan, Duryodhan fell to the heads and uh, he realized that these are not fully mature adults. He, these must be the sons of the Pandavas. And so he was disgusted with Ashvatthama. And when, <coughs> when the Pandavas found out Arjuna promised Draupadi that you will take your bath tomorrow standing on Ashvatthama's head. In other words, he would take the life of Ashvatthama. And sure enough, it was a little bit of a longer story, but he eventually caught Ashvatthama and he dragged him back to the camp of the Pandavas and he threw him before Yudhisthira and Draupadi. And uh, immediately Draupadi started to... Uh, Say that I say this is the son of Drona Acharya. He's our spiritual master, but now he's left this world. So the son is as good as the father. So he's our spiritual master. We can't kill a Brahman. And you, you say, yes, I say there's no injunction for killing a Brahman in the Shastras. So he cannot be killed. Draupadi is right. But Krishna said immediately, kill him. <laughs> And, uh, and Bhima also, yes, kill him. And so Arjuna had to do two things. He had to please Krishna and Bhima and also he had to please Draupadi and Yudhisthira. 
And so Krishna, this is where we, our Krishna consciousness comes in. When we're in some dilemma, we have to remember Krishna. So Arjuna looked at Krishna, <laughs> what do I do? And then Krishna gave him a clue. He says we have to simultaneously please Yudhisthira and Draupadi and, we simul and kill Ashvatthama and, and not kill Ashvatthama and we have to simultaneously please Krishna and Bhima and kill Ashvatthama. And so being intelligent, not being phased by the situation, relying on Krishna for intelligence, Krishna gave him the ability to understand what to do. So he did exactly the same as Balaram did. <clears throat> he cut off the top knot from Balaram's, from um, Ashwatthama's head. In other words, that was a sign of a Brahmin. And so he lost his caste. So for, you know, uh, an exalted personality, uh, being insulted is worse than death. <laughs> so he actually did more than kill him. He lost his caste. And so he satisfied both parties. Um, <clears throat> so what's this got to do with us? Will we ever be put into that situation like Arjuna was put into? Will we ever be put into the situation like Balaram was put into? No, we'll be put into even more difficult situations. There's a story, I think uh, Maharaj was speaking a few days ago about the forest fire in the 17th chapter, I think, of the um, <clears throat> Krishna book. So this pastime is the forest fire where Lord Krishna and the coward boys, they were um, diverted from looking after the cows. They saw the cows go into the forest and or they saw that the cows had gone into the forest, so they went looking after them. And in the distance was some smoke. It just only a little bit of smoke. You know what I mean? I, see, I was going on the bridge out in the sea, and as we were going out to sea, there was this smoke coming up from the land. I thought, oh, there must be a house on fire. And then as we got closer, I saw it was actually a small chimney. But the, the smoke was going all over Bombay. And so... It seemed like a little affair, so they didn't take much notice of it. And then eventually, by following the footprints of the cows and calves and where they'd eaten the grass, they found them. But because they'd been distracted from the smoke, a little bit of smoke, smoke means fire, <laughs> and, but they'd been distracted, all of a sudden they saw that there was a raging fire all the way around them. And so, what did they do? You know, has anybody seen a forest fire? And lived. <laughs> from a distance, a good distance. You have to be well away from a forest fire. I heard that they can travel at 60 kilometers a mile, uh, an, an hour. You know, they get the wind behind them. So this fire had traveled so fast because, you know, there's a bla blazing fire and then crack, the branches exploded and it goes hundreds of yards and it's another tree which may be behind you and then <laughs> So this is the nature of the forest fire. And so they took shelter of Krishna. And he said, okay, if you've got faith in me, close your eyes. And uh, so they had full faith, this is the point, they had full faith in Krishna. So Krishna immediately took care of the situation. <laughs> forest fire finished. So where else can we find forest fires? Or not necessarily forest fires. Might even be temple fires. <laughs> Yatra fires. <laughs> and uh, movement fires. Is that possible? All the time. And what's the saving grace that we learn from uh, Balaram? We learn from Arjuna. We learn how to act. In, we don't see differences as being the real, that w I'm right and you are wrong. This is when the problem starts. It's called um, sect, the flames of sectarianism. And then when I'm right and, I, and you are wrong, what happens then? We look for allies. <laughs> We've got to, when, we want, when we're right, you know, it's not just, nobody's going to take 
not just one person. You've got to have some allies to say, yes, he's right. And then we've got a case. Is that right? <laughs> and then the other side, they have to also back up their right. And then what happens? We get two factions. And never the two shall meet. Just over something very si simple. It's happened with the Gaudiya Mat. So, you know, it's even more serious. When we have devotees living together, we have to learn how to live together. That's why Prabhupada said before he left this world, he said, organization and intelligence. And part of that intelligence doesn't just mean knowing, you know, how to do things, how to gain knowledge and do things. It means having the intelligence. See, if I don't cooperate, then I have no intelligence. If I can't learn how to cooperate and see both dichotomies, both sides of the story, then nothing's going to work. The whole, the whole thing revolves on cooperating with our intelligence, seeing what the long-term benefit, what happens in this situation if this carries on going the way it's going, then there's going to be factions. And when there's factions, then you know, it's very difficult to, it's, it's even more difficult to make. So before there's a faction, let's not make a faction. Sometimes we have to agree to differ, but at the same time we have to agree to agree. Is that right? We may feel that I don't really agree with this person, but this seems to be the thing which people or the devotees want to go, so let me agree with it. Even Prabhupada would do that. Sometimes he tried to preach in a certain situation, but he, he saw that things are going this way, and he, he was the leader of the mov movement. He had most clout. But he knew that <coughs> if a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And so this is where we let Krishna into the equation. That Krishna is a saving grace, just like the coward boys. They couldn't see any way out. They took shelter of Krishna. So Krishna, if we learn to cooperate, then we please Krishna. And then Krishna, Krishna will ameliorate the situation. <coughs> so this is what I was gleaning from this particular, I was going forward a little bit into, you know, because there's not much of a port, but it's explaining that on the pretext of going to a holy place, Lord Balaram, he uh, decided not to engage in the battle of Kurukshetra, but to go on pilgrimage. But the pilgrimage was to kill Roma Harshina Sutta and also to kill, what was the other one? Balvala. Balvala was another culprit. He was passing stool, urine, blood, pus on the uh, sacrificial arena. Um, so I think uh, we've covered nearly everything there. Yes, yeah, so Prabhupada said, I'll just recap. He gave five regulative principles. Or four, four regulative principles. <laughs> I think I mentioned this last time, did I? There's, what are they? No meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex, and no intoxication. But he mentioned another one. It's one verse in the Chaitanya Chaitamrita Madhya And he's saying there are certain things a devotee has to give up if he wants to make progress in spiritual life. And the first one he mentioned is kap uh, kapatya. Crookedness. Crooked dealings. Duplicity. And then he goes on to write about it. And he's talking to one of his disciples. You become, uh, you become a politician. Everybody wants to become Hirani Kashipu. He was seeing that his disciples were disagreeing. And in that purport, he says, when we're in that frame of mind where <coughs> there's duplicitousness, the, the culprit's mind is always suspicious of others. So this quality of straightforwardness is so important. Simplicity it's called, is that right? Simple and straightforward. So Balaram was simple and straightforward. 
Ramahashina Sutta was not simple and straightforward. He hadn't really understood the philosophy. What's that? What's the philosophy? Trinada Pisa Nichena, Tarada Pisa Hishnana, Amanina Madhyadena Kirtaniya Sadahari. In this frame of mind, we can actually learn to see other people's points of view. And then we can actually get the best out of the situation. It's not like the material concept where we have to dominate and overcome. No, we have to put our point of view forward in a humble state of mind, depend on Krishna. In this way we can cooperate together. We are not the be all and end all in a decision. You know, it's good to think I'm going to help this movement to go forward, I'm going to do all I but it's not just reliant on that. This is a good attitude, providing we prevent we are dependent on Krishna. So I'll stop there. Does anybody have any comments or any uh, questions? We should act as if everything depends on us, but understand that everything depends on Krishna. We should work as if everything depends on us, we'll always be fully dependent on Krishna. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Gora Premanandi